thought <laughs> that's a good plan coming in here. Right. Yep. And I'm just going to look at the slides and um, and then you just introduce me when you're ready. Yes. Give me just a minute here to. Yeah, of course. You could bring up your screen and you should be live. All right, as I see people are still, you know, coming into the, the presentation, we um, we can certainly hang out for a minute or so um, until, or we can, we can start and you can introduce, <laughs> we can introduce Tony when he arrives. I think it'll work out um, just to start. Given we've got an hour and a half and a lot of information, I, I, let's let's get going. All right. So, good evening, everybody, and it is evening for us here in Maine. Um, I am Kathy Dion, the executive director for the Autism Society of Maine, and I'm being joined tonight for our. This is our coffee with Kathy segment. So, of course, that's very fitting for uh, Dr. Garnett in your area. You're in Australia, and it's early in the morning there, so. You have coffee. I do not have coffee, but um, that's usually what our segment is called. And, and Dr. Atwood's going to be joining us in a few minutes. So we thought we would just do a small introduction. Uh, and I know that you've written some really good books and we do have one of them in our library. I'd like to get some of the other ones. Um, and I know Dr. Atwood also has a really amazing amount of books that he's written. We have a really a lot of his um, literature. I've met him a couple of times when he's come to Maine. Have, have you ever come to Maine? I haven't, Kathy. I would love to come to Maine. It would be very nice. I wish we could come now and do it live. It's yeah. uh, we miss the travel. We miss um, coming to the states. So now I can hear that. That's Tony now. So oh, would you like to continue the intro, and I'll get him settled, and then we can launch. Yes, that would be great. So I'll just give people a couple of um, uh, things that we're going to be doing. So at the end of the presentation. There's an email that's gonna go out automatically to everybody. It's a survey. We'd really appreciate if you would fill out the survey. And if you want a copy of the slides and the PowerPoint that's being presented in that survey, just put your email address and we'll know that you're looking for the, a copy of the slides. We'll also try to put them in the chat box, but there was some issues last time we did that where people couldn't open them. So we're just letting you know that if you fill out the survey and put your email in one of the comment boxes, we can go ahead and forward that on to you. Um, you'll get to see this on our website also, and we're really happy and excited tonight to have um, two wonderful professionals who've been in the field, and, and I'm not sure if this is exactly right, but I did read where together their knowledge and experience is somewhere around 70 years. <laughs> um, so I, I'm very happy that we can have Dr. Atwood joining us and Dr. Garnett joining us. And um, tonight's segment, we all know that uh, a lot of adults and um, adolescents are dealing with some depression and, and beating the blues, let's say. So we're excited that you're going to be able to sit in and be able to um, join us and go over that. So um, I and please, Dr. Atwood, get comfortable. I'm so sorry. We forgot about the uh, time difference, <laughs> not the time difference, the um, uh, daylight savings time. <laughs> Right. But we are here and there's no problem with Kathy. It's lovely to be here. Tony's just arrived. He's just driven an hour to get here from Peachtree where he lives in North Brisbane. Yes. And we are very excited to be sharing the information today about exploring depression and beating the blues. So if you like, Kathy, we can just launch. We can just start. I think that's beautiful. I, I, I can't thank you both enough. And I did tell people that if they have questions, we'll try to get to them at the end. They can Put them in the chat box and maybe right. towards the end we can um and and i'll turn my camera off because I, I want people to enjoy your presentation and focus on both you two so if you need something though i am here and i'm listening i just don't want to be a distraction at all all right kathy that's wonderful um come in whenever you would like and we will um be you know welcoming your comments or questions because i know you know we're, we're just going to assume that it's all going well but if it's not please interrupt and help us out i am aware i'm screen sharing so you can see the slides at the moment yes yeah 
Okay, brilliant. That's fantastic. Well, well, we well, well, yes, um, I was going to say good morning, but it's, it's, it's for you guys. Really it's late afternoon and delighted about it. This is a, a sign of, of, of not having autism is that I'm okay. <laughs> this is change. This is unexpected. This is not on the script. No. But I'm going to take a deep breath and do all the things that I advise other people to do and just take it with the flow. And that's okay. <laughs> we are. We're going to be flexible and we're not going to self injure. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it can happen in autism, but not, not today, not here. So, Kathy, we'll get started, shall we? Yes, you may go right ahead and thank you again okay. for being here. Thank okay. you so much for hosting this, Kathy. Okay, so good morning, good evening, everyone. Uh, Tony and I are excited to be able to bring some thoughts and ideas to you of what we've collected mm. from the journey we've been on in autism for a collective experience of 80, just over 80 years between us. So we have been bitten by the bug. We love autism. We're very much enjoying our journey. Uh, having said that, I know it's not always easy. And this particular topic is a difficult one in terms of it's difficult to suffer depression. It's something that can come in and there are many reasons for it. So if we can start by just um, describing to you that we found in the research, and this tallies with our personal um, and clinical yes, experience, yeah. that about one in three autistic adolescents and adults have yeah. episodic depression. It comes and goes uh, often. Uh, sometimes it comes and stays. And this is what we might call dysthymia, low mood for a long period. Now, there's many reasons why people with autism can sometimes feel sad and this can develop into a deep depression. Tony and I are going to take it in turns to go through some of the reasons why a person with autism can feel sad. One of the core features of having autism, of course, is other people can be difficult to understand and relate to and other people don't necessarily get autism. So it can be difficult for people with autism to get along with other people, whether they have autism or whether they're neurotypical. And that can cause a deep sense of loneliness, mm -hmm. that no one gets me, that I'm alone in this world on my own, trying to work it all yeah. out. It, in autism, there's a strong need for connectedness. Yes. And who do I connect to? And if I can't find someone to connect to, mm. what's the point? I would yeah. say there's a mm. strong need for connectedness in all of yeah. us, whether we yes. have autism yeah. or not. But it's important to point out that people with autism need to connect and want to connect, yes. even though their behavior and actions sometimes seem to speak a different story to us. Yeah. So one of the issues in the social world for someone with autism is that they can often be rejected. It's not mm. just being you know, perceived to be rejected, but they are actually rejected. They're excluded from events. They're not invited to the office party or get togethers after work. Uh, at school, there can be exclusion. There can be bullying and teasing. Unfortunately, we know that for about 95% in the research is telling us that people with autism will experience bullying and teasing. And we've been horrified by the levels of that for yeah. some people. Uh, often our, our concern isn't autism, it's neurotypicals. And neurotypicals can do despicable, um, cruel, it's, teasing and bullying, yeah. which you think, oh dear, how on earth do you cope with How do you cope? Hmm. And the stories that we've heard, unfortunately, you know, this has actually led to long term depression in adulthood. So the bullying and teasing is a risk factor for developing depression hmm. later on. Yeah. Uh, we also know that being autistic, just managing the daily tasks of life is exhausting and dealing with social situations, interactions and sensory causes overwhelming exhaustion and distress and just exhaustion can cause mm -hmm. depression we also know that unfortunately for people with autism they tend to remember the things that have gone wrong in life and uh, one way this plays out is that they tend to remember criticisms not compliments so if they are given a compliment they may not recognize it but they often don't even remember it and unfortunately, mm. particularly from peers, there are few compliments, but there's a lot of criticism and they hold on to that. So their self-esteem can become based on 
uh, criticism, not compliments. Another factor in autism is we found that people are very sensitive to the suffering of others. We call it the empathic over arousal, which is interesting because yes. we tend to think that in autism, it's an empathy deficit. Not that at all. It's the original description. No. It's not at all. No. In fact, yes. we know that people with autism have an enormous sense of empathy they connect emotionally to others and feel other people's pain mm. often stronger than the person feeling the original emotion themselves felt yeah. it. it it's a bit mm. like covid but for emotions yes and the person picks them up but also amplifies them mm. and so the origins are that they've absorbed them from someone from else someone else yes. And this, of course, can be exhausting and cause a lot of emotional mm. discordance through the day. Another factor can be living circumstances. If the person is living with someone that they don't get along with, there can be some stress in the household or because of unemployment or underemployment, they may be suffering poverty, lack of resources, and that can lead to yeah. feeling very low as uh, well. On that theme can be clashes at home, especially if somebody else in the family mm also has autism doesn't mean to say they're going to get on no. so it may be a father and son for example who just have very similar ways of thinking but just don't get on just don't get on yeah tony i was as i said earlier uh we'll take it in turn so would you like to get a lead on this slide okay um Anxious thoughts becoming depressive thoughts. Psychologically and conceptually, we tend to think of anxiety as worried about what could happen. Depression is you know what's going to happen, but it's going to be a disaster. So the anxiety can eventually progress to depression. There's a lot of self-criticism. Um, not When we look at this criticism, it, it doesn't come from parents. It doesn't come from peers or teachers. The worst critic in autism is the self Another is being bored at school or work, underachieving. You have someone who has an intellectual, we were talking about a, a client we saw yesterday, um, the intellectual capacity of a Rolls Royce. Yes. But he was stuck in the garage, garage and couldn't use it. And you feel depressed that I've got this knowledge, but I'm not using it. Um, it's not feeling understood by anyone, as we've implied. It's that seeking a friend, and they only need just one friend. Not getting the grades or work performance for your abilities. But also worry about whether you'll ever have a long-term relationship. And the person may be late in terms of romantic relationships, but after a while, especially as an adult, may feel, will nobody ever fall in love with me? Yeah. Yeah, and also genetic predisposition. Mm. We've known since the 70s that when we look at the parents of autistic kids and adults, that there's a higher level of anxiety and depression in the family. So there may be a genetic predisposition. Thank you. Okay, if you want yeah, to take... I'll yeah, I'll take the next mm. one. So one of the issues can be, particularly in the teenage years, there can be a real worry about whether the person will achieve, what will happen next? We know that change and transitions are incredibly difficult for people on the autism spectrum. And to actually have a sense of optimism about the future when you know that a huge change is coming, that suddenly you have to become independent and function in the real world. And do I have the skills to do that? There's often a lot of anxiety. So worry and anxiety instead of excitement and looking forward to becoming independent and having a successful career is a reason to feel sad. We know as well that uh, pessimism tends to come along with autism, maybe a genetic predisposition, mm -hmm. as Tony was saying, a sense of doom and gloom. What, what bad thing will, will happen next? What's going to hit me next? Mm -hmm. They tend to be the glass half empty uh, people in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's not a choice. It's, uh, as I say, this is a genetic uh, set point. We all tend to have a genetic set point for how much happiness that we feel. And often people on the autism spectrum, probably due to having high levels of worry and anxiety and hypervigilance, tend to be focused on what might go wrong yeah. so they can be prepared for it. The other issue is being in a a marginalized group, a minority group, because there's only one in 100, or, or as more recent stats would say, one in 52, but still not, not neurotypical. And yet, having to live in a neurotypical world and having to pretend to be someone you're not 
And that can feel like a constant pressure, which is exhausting and can lead to depression because of a lack of sense of authenticity in the way that you live and a lack of uh, joining with what's happening, feeling that I'm living my authentic life and I'm being loved for who I am. Instead, it can feel like I'm putting on personas and masks and they're kind of not working. And, I, and why do I have to hide my, my true self? Loss uh, can, can trigger depression. So it could be a loss of a friendship, a pet or a family member. But often the person with autism can really have a huge issue with adjustment mm. to the loss. And they hold on for a very long time and find it difficult to move away from that uh, experience of just wanting the person or the pet yeah. back. Yeah. I, I think that, that it's a whole different ball game of, mm. of the grieving process in autism. Yeah. Um, it's not being able to disclose your feelings or use conventional strategies. So it means that in grief, the autism is going to get deeper and longer, including some of the depression. So yeah. sometimes a year or two later, they're yes. grieving the death of grandma, for example, or the dog. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Now, another issue, as you know, in autism is sensory sensitivity. And sometimes there can be just despair as the person goes into adolescence and adult life that it's not gotten better it's still as bad as it ever was mm. and with anxiety anxiety actually increases sensory sensitivity so that can make it worse so the person is feeling very depressed that they still can't stand loud noises or or bright lights how are they going to get on in this world when that's causing so much background stress Another issue is trying to cope with so many changes in life. As we know, in adolescence and particularly then in launching into adulthood, there's a lot mm. of change. And of course, being just having a diagnosis can be a cause of depression for some. Again, that not seeing the strengths, the abilities, the personality mm. characteristics and values that come along with autism, mm. the person falls into thinking that autism is, ah, oh, it's a disaster. It's yeah. a defect. There's something wrong with me. And they can hold on to this view in a very, very rigid manner uh, because of anxiety and depression. And that causes a lot of self-doubt. Mm. So we, we do see being diagnosed with autism can be a reason to mm. be sad. Now, another reason is, is getting into trouble because of your anger. We'll go through this later on. But sometimes in autism, um, depression is actually expressed as anger it, it is in the general population but more so in autism and we call that an agitated angry externalized directed at others depression and you go into attack mode uh, of anyone or an object because of your despair of your circumstances so sometimes anger management is going to be an issue with someone who's depressed not having enough strategies to feel happy again uh, your special interest gives you your greatest pleasure but there are very few pleasures in life feeling invisible at school or work nobody seems to recognize you or be pleased to see you and are being aware of and troubled by social injustice often what will occur is the person has this is this is wrong and they really take it to heart at a very deep emotional level that the world is not fair and one of the provocative comments is not fair being infected by the sadness of others we, we've gone through there but experiencing or having experienced abuse and this is another area mm. we're starting to recognize is abuse yes and it's all forms of abuse mm. and it, it from bullying and teasing to sexual abuse physical abuse verbal abuse and so on and the traumatic because it goes deeper and you have fewer repair mechanisms you have difficulty disclosing so for many, there's PTSD and all the issues that are associated with that. Mm. Also, distress regarding gender identity. This is, again, another new area that individuals often from quite an early age, relatively, sometimes 11, 12, 13 years old, are questioning not only who am I and who am I going to be, but am I the right gender? Mm. And the emotions that are associated with that can lead to great despair difficulty disclosing it and so one of the contributory factors in depression in young teenagers for example is asking about are you happy with your gender yeah just on um mm. i meant to say earlier tanya when you were talking about the being mm. infected by sadness in other people one of the issues of course uh we are all facing around the world is COVID-19 and the shutdowns mm. and the lockdowns and the death. And uh, one thing I've certainly found in my clinical mm. practice is that whilst 
uh, many of my autistic clients are for, at first delighted in the shutdowns because they didn't <laughs> yes, have to be I don't have social. to go out. I don't have to party. Yeah. I don't have, a, I don't I don't have, have to, to see anyone out. today. Yes, yeah. joy. I love this. Yeah. Uh, not um, fear of missing out. Um, joy of missing out. Joy of missing out, out. yeah. Yes. Uh, however, uh, there's a lot of sadness at the, around the world at the moment. And I've also noticed over time that uh, my clients are becoming more and more infected by that sadness yeah. of feeling the weight of the burden of this pandemic heavily on their shoulders yeah. and not being able to easily dismiss that and just get on with life. Yeah. But what this, what this means is we've gone through the reasons to feel sad. If you're going to treat depression, it's not just swallowing an SSRI medication. No. It is very complicated. Yeah. And in fact, it, you have to identify what are the reasons for this individual. And you have to have a strategy for each of those. Yes, so that's important was because we've started this just to describe why mm. people with autism can yeah. feel depressed and sad. But the uh, the item the items that we've just gone through each one and i know there's more but we don't have time to go through all of them in our book this is actually a questionnaire mm. and the person will complete that tick the boxes and then have a reflection time to think which are the three or four key reasons yes we use a, a, pie a pie chart, chart. of a hundred percent and then once we know as a priority or a weighting for each of these, mm. which is going to be more of the focus for therapy. For therapy, yeah. yeah. And that just does, it, it means that certainly an SSRI medication or other medication for, for depression is sometimes indicated if the sadness is too deep to be mm. able to uh, use some of the strategies that we're going to describe today, then certainly medication is indicated. But... Um, medication alone, of course, can't actually fix the reasons. Behind yes, it won't end loneliness. As exactly no. as Tony was saying. Yeah. So, uh, continuing on, uh, we just want to talk a bit more about the clinical experience of depression and autism, and then the characteristics of depression, and some research before we go into strategies. So, uh, one of the issues in autism we found is that, that uh, unfortunately despite their very good intentions, any friends or family members feel often they cannot alleviate the depression of their loved one with autism. The normal strategies they use, yeah. like compassion, reassurance, affection, distraction with other activities or enjoyable social experiences don't seem to resonate with the person. They just seem to rigidly want to almost wallow in the depression and it's not that they're wallowing it's not that they're enjoying it it's <laughs> no. just that they're stuck they're so stuck mm. and the typical ways that we as neurotypicals may try to jolly someone up just doesn't seem to work they can't join with that the despair is too mm. low and it's a single track mind social experiences for example are often shunned uh, particularly yeah. by an autistic person who's depressed now what they do enjoy doing uh, is to try to resolve the depression by solitary. Sorry, I've just got a very strange <laughs> little. The play, are we going to play music? Yeah, no, no. It, it's a very. I don't know how to get rid of an that. Antique guys. Clock oh, there it is. My... That's in the in the background, which is actually yeah. very. Um, both of us are. We originally come from England, so we, we have very much the the, the British cultural. Uh, anyway. We, the, the, we have it. We're sitting in an 1850s dining room. I love antiques, and my grandfather clock just gonged, and that's why my computer thought I wanted to play music. <laughs> <laughs> Never had that one before. No. Nope. Anyway, uh, another way that our um, loved ones with autism will try to uh, distract themselves from their own depression is to use their special interest. Mm. So, in terms of tools in the toolbox. There tends to be two very strong ones, solitude, like everyone else, go away, and special interest, I'd rather do that than anything else. The special interest is great. The difficulty is if it's dominating their world, so they're not actually able to engage yeah. in anything else, like screen time. If a person's spending 12, 14 hours on the screen, there's not a lot of time to be engaging with friends, family, taking exercise, mm -hmm. doing things that will relax the person. And where we've noticed uh, our, our clients doing that, they tend to have 
extremes of emotion. So while they're engaged in the special interest, they can actually feel joy, connection to the interest, a huge sense yeah. of enjoyment. It in is, life. and that's so rare in their and that's life. So rare. They're and then parents are saying, it. "Or they, no, no, stop doing it." Yeah. But I have no other pleasure in and life. Yes, there's the problem. The other problem is it's a thought blocker. So it suppressed the emotion and the angst of how they feel about mm. themselves in their lives. And so when it's when that thought blocker is uh, taken away, of course, the thoughts don't have not gone. They're there and they've been building and they come back in a big way, like a boomerang, just bang. And the person has experiences even more intense despair. Yeah, yeah. That, that was something we were, we, Michelle and I were talking about the other day, yeah. is that the person may resent you switching mm. off the computer and so on. Yes. Um, but yeah. what's happening is they're not necessarily against you. What it means is that this deluge, deluge. that they've suppressed of mm. despair or anxiety suddenly comes. That's why they're upset mm. because they've got a deluge of negative As thoughts. Of negative thoughts, yeah. negativity. And it's even more difficult to manage, of course. So that's the issue with special interests. So the reason we're laboring this point is please don't take away the special mm. interest. Don't remove the screen yeah. entirely, but just think about it as one of the activities in the day. And there's settings you can create in the background so that it actually, the, the game will switch off at a time after two hours or something like that. Two hours is enough at one time. Another issue as we've talked about is the person's concept of self can be based on criticism and the rejection of peers and so they feel that they are unworthy unlikable unlovable and that that certainly is a seed for depression to really have a negative um, self-view mm. now there are other characteristics of depression associated with autism and that's a depression attack mm. this is we really picked it up in autism more than anywhere else and that is seen it anywhere else the no. emotions come in despair and this may be a seven or eight year old who doesn't explode but implodes it, it's almost like a meltdown but it's mm. very intense it's very brief it's short duration but mm. very uh, scary for all concerned and this person says i'm going to kill myself there's no point in life i'm going to hold my breath till i die mm. and you think oh what it, it, it is serious that is a reflection of the depth of despair it begins as quickly as it ends however you are aware that sometimes somebody very young may be considering suicide, but it may Absolutely. occur in yeah, later yeah. life. Yeah. And it's that lifelong issue of pessimism. Yeah. And oh dear, you, it just negative, negative. Neurotypicals have this psychosis, this disturbance of reality called autism. <laughs> Some of them some of them are disturbingly optimistic. Now, uh, anger to explode and cleanse the system. In other words, yeah. there's a buildup of tension. I have an explosion, then I reset my whole emotion system. Mm. So I'm depressed, down, miserable. But if I explode, I feel better again. Mm. Now, rather than surrender to depression, uh, that is self-blame, they go into attack mode, blaming others can occur. And there's a lack of self-reflection. We'll may go through this later on of issues of interception and alexithymia and theory of mind. They all confirm that there is a lack of self-insight and reflection to conceptualize and communicate your inner thoughts and feelings. Mm. So it's not just a question of, I'm not engaged with people because I don't understand them. It's more a question of, I don't know how to explain it. Yeah. And how could you help anyway? Yeah. And I've got to solve it myself. Neurotypicals, bit of a problem. First thought, who can help me? But in autism, no, you're a problem. I must solve it myself. And Tony's really speaking about an aspect of autism that we're coming to understand mm. more and more. Now, this, this is a subclinical condition called alexithymia. A, lack of lexi words, thymia, emotions. A, lack of words for emotions. Alexithymia doesn't occur solely in autism, mm. but we know that many people with autism have alexithymia as well as autism. It's not just that they have difficulty putting their emotions into words. They often have difficulty putting their thoughts into words, as Tony said, mm. self-reflection issues, but also difficulty actually reading the internal cues mm. of anxiety yeah. of distress but also of pain temperature and 
um, hunger and thirst. So interoception, the ability to pick up what the body is telling us, important messages that help us self-regulate, the, the system is not working so well. They're not picking that up. The brain is working slightly differently and they're not picking up those signals. Now that's difficult because it means that it deprives the person of the opportunity to understand what's mm -hmm. going on inside the body, to be able to give themselves a strategy, do something different, catch, yeah. catch the anxiety at a low level before it becomes a yes. panic attack yeah. or recognize this, the loneliness and depression before it becomes a depression attack or it becomes a fully blown major depressive episode. So one mm -hmm. of the things that we do in therapy, and we're going to come to this in terms of strategies, is address the alexithymia. There's a lot we can do to assist person, mm -hmm. a person with alexithymia. Mm. Now, there is depression uh, research, and it's really in the last five years that people are actually starting to look at this. So we'll have a look at some of the research. Mm -hmm. Now, first of all, prevalence. 2019 meta-analysis of the research and the prevalence of clinical depression um, is, and in the current time, 23%, lifetime, 37%. As you can see, there's a lot of reasons for someone with autism to feel depressed, but it's clinical depression here. And with uh, Craig Evans and Anita Lesko, both based in the United States, we contributed to a book called Been There, Done That, Try This, an Aspie's Guide to Life on Earth. Mm. We asked 300 uh, adults with autism, uh, what are your biggest challenges in life? The top one was anxiety. I think number two was depression. And 76% of adults with autism reported having daily problems with feeling sad and despondent. In other words, not severe enough for a clinical depression, 33% or so, but 76% is feeling episodic sadness. So it's very important to recognize that this is, we don't think of it as a constitutional part of autism, but a vulnerability in autism. Mm. Now, the next one, loneliness and depression, 2018, uh, results highlighted the possible contribution of loneliness. What's interesting is what Michelle and I have been finding clinically over the decades is now being confirmed by the research. Mm -hmm. So it gives credibility to the issues that we face. Now, that means that treatment for depression must focus on social skills and social confidence and network for helping that individual. So loneliness. Uh, to depression and thoughts of self-harm. Now, treatment options that target loneliness may provide beneficial in improving, may be beneficial in improving mental health outcomes for ASD. I would add that to anorexia nervosa, gender dysphoria, all the other associated diagnoses that can occur with autism, you must include in your treatment program, improving social connectedness skills, et cetera. So, Loneliness can be understood as either a symptom of or a predisposing factor for autism mm -hmm. and depression. Now, unfortunately, suicidal ideation and suicidal attempts. Michelle and I have known people that we have supported and we haven't been effective. And we hear tragically that they are here no more. Now, this was in the, uh, an article in 2008. Half of the adult sample with autism had had suicidal ideation and clinically we say okay it's a thought okay it's an option and you've got to look at all options the problem is that you start to make it an act and you prepare you rehearse and so on that's when it's taken on board more seriously so treating depression is really dealing with a high mortality in autism due to suicidal ideation and attempts now another study 2014 roughly a third of autistic adults had attempted suicide. And there's a book there, Living Through Suicide Loss with an Autism Spectrum Disorder by Lisa Morgan, published by Jessica Kingsley Publishers. So we're getting the information from those with autism, describing it in their autobiographies or often, but also in research studies. So one in three have attempted suicide. Wow, general population, 4%. Mm, yeah. Very high. So what do we do about it? Mm. We literally wrote this book to save lives. We were very concerned that there was not enough. The, somebody said, better read than dead. Better read than dead. <laughs> I like it. Absolutely. 
uh, we found that there was some good programs out there, some uh, great ideas for how to assist autistic people with their anxiety and with their anger. Mm. But we had even written a book on how to assist a person with autism to understand affection, but there was nothing out there on how do we treat depression. Mm. And unfortunately, what we had found is that sometimes, not always, but sometimes the conventional programs for depression were not working. And, or the antidepressants were not working. Mm. The research is showing that for autistic adults, they tend, to, and adolescents, they tend to get more adverse reactions with the SSRIs than the typical population, and it may be less effective. So if an, a medication is considered, we tend mm. to suggest go low and slow. So low dose and titrate up very slowly because of those possibilities of some yeah. reactions we don't want. So we wrote the Exploring Depression and Beating the Blues program. That's a picture of it. We're very proud of it. We're going to describe it a little bit. It evolved over several years. I would estimate about six years where Tony and I... Yes, we, we evolved it. We evolved it. But we've been dealing with it for a long time. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, absolutely. Mm. We have. So when we came to evolve it, the way that happened was that we decided we would run groups and we called it Exploring Optimism. <laughs> I love I love that. <laughs> Unfortunately, our participants did not agree. They said, what are we doing here? We're not the op optimistic group. We're the depressed group. And we thought, oh, for face validity, to give people a sense yeah. of being understood and validated for their feelings, we've got to call it. It's exploring depression. Mm. We've got to understand the depression before we reach optimism. We get that. So it was designed to explore with the person the reasons for their depression, but importantly, strategies to help. So what uh, ended up happening was we evolved the program with adolescents, young adults, older adults mm. in groups with a team of people using it individually and getting feedback and then uh, put it to trial. We have a lovely collaborative relationship with our researchers over at University of Queensland, particularly um, Kate Sofronoff, but also Jeannie Sheffield and Damien Santamoro. And there was a randomized controlled trial of this program published in 2016. Mm. The, we <clears throat> noticed positive effect, effects in the clinic, particularly for mild to moderate or moderate to severe depression. But if the depression was very severe, it needed longer and often yeah. some more intensive help. Mm. This we ran weekly. However, the book itself, I think it goes in, yes. So when we look at the book as you may have it now, it's a self-help intervention. The reason we wanted to create a self-help intervention is we know that not everyone has access to a clinical psychologist with specialization in ASD. It is something you can do on your own. We're also aware that some people will not go to a psychologist, even if one is available, and that they are stuck in their room. So we wanted something they could do on their own. Aspies, people with autism, tend to be very self-directed. However, we found it's even more effective if there's a mentor. So if someone can offer support, for example, a parent or a family friend or a a friend, just a friend can do it, a counsellor, then the person when they're lagging in motivation, because motivation is affected when we're depressed, we don't feel as motivated, we don't have the energy, there's someone else who can assist them to join back with their motivation and keep going with the program. It does take effort. Mm -hmm. It's possible, but it does take effort. The first four stages are really about understanding, identifying and expressing the emotions that are going on. Yeah. Crucial for healing is not suppressing them anymore, allowing them out. And it's interesting when we allow the emotion and we just observe it and we're present to it and we allow ourselves to feel the pain, it shifts and it moves. And we feel like it'll never go away. Those clouds will never go away. They do go away. We, we can actually observe the feeling and get to the end of the feeling and then another, a new feeling comes in. Yeah. And that's what we want. We're also addressing, of course, there the issues of alexithymia and difficulties with self-reflection. Mm -hmm. So the components of the program, it has 10 stages after an initial assessment. The initial assessment looks at why 
as we've gone through this morning, and the degree of the depression on a questionnaire. And then these are the 10 stages. You can see them on your screen. We go through, I'm just going to read them because we're going to uh, touch on some of these in more depth. We go through self-awareness in terms of who am I? What are my qualities? What are my abilities? Yeah. They've often not thought about that because of that emphasis qualities? on criticism and yeah. negativity. Yeah. I'm crap. I'm crap. Yeah. Yeah. The world's crap. My future's yeah. crap is the definition of depression. So what is depression uh, for the person and why you may feel and stay depressed is stage two. Stage three is starting to introduce some of the emotional repair tools that we have. And the first one we're really big on is physical activity. The reason we love physical activity is because movement is good for the body and the mind. If, if we stay sitting all day, we stay stuck, body and mind, no difference, totally connected, the mind stays stuck. We need to move. Bodies were made for movement. They don't have to go out and play soccer with the local team, but just walking outside and being in the fresh air and experiencing sunlight on the body and this experience of walking and moving is so very, very helpful to the mind and body. We introduce art and pleasure tools. Many, not all, but many of our guys on the autism spectrum love art. They're good at art. And it's a wonderful way to express emotions when you have alexithymia. If you can't say it, draw it or sculpt mm. it or build a collage or anything to do with art and color or even black and white can be so expressive. The next stage, stage five, is thinking tools because thinking and perception really informs our self-view, our worldview. And what mm. we're trying to do is really look at what's going on in the way you're making sense of who you are and how you are in the world. And we find often there's some very maladaptive thinking patterns that are keeping the person depressed. So we need to uncover mm. those, assist the person to start to realize when those are happening and give them some tools to reanalyze mm. their, their, their own lives really. We continue with thinking tools in both stages six and seven, but in these stages, we also introduce what we call social tools. Now, <laughs> someone who's neurotypical may not need that one introduced or explained, yeah. but we do find that for an autistic person, the idea that someone else could help is outside awareness. They yes. don't think of it typically. Yeah. They, they can be taught that, but it's not the innate uh, feeling that they have they're very self-directed and uh, e egocentric in their view but also very kind of um, independent and autonomous in what they want mm -hmm. to do but what we find is that when they're taught logically that well you know actually if you have someone that you can share a problem with that person has more uh, has another opinion may have more ideas more life experience it could be helpful to get their point of view. That's a logical thing to imagine that could happen. They give it a go and they come back and go, you know what, it, it made me feel better. I actually felt better after I'd spoken about it. And that's a very human quality. Even, even people on the autism spectrum have, they, they don't anticipate it, but after they've told the problem, they actually feel better, especially when they're validated. Validation is huge. Yeah, and on that topic, we also have to explain to the neurotypical how to relate to the person. Don't mm. try and fix the problem. Um, don't criticize, etc. So in other words, the person themselves, whether it be a friend or a family member and so on, mm. needs guidelines of, of just should we say supportive listening? Mm. Don't try and solve, don't interrogate. Why are you feeling upset? What's the problem here? So it, it's both sides. How do you approach neurotypicals to resolve some of your depression? How can neurotypicals change their style mm. to meet autism? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. So social tools, amazing. Relaxation tools. Many of our guys have never ever learned to relax. They don't understand the feeling of relaxation and certainly don't know how to bring relaxation into the body on cue when they need it, when they're feeling agitated or stressed. So this is a tool we teach them. Uh, we continue that theme in session eight or stage eight. Uh, and then we cover unhelpful tools uh, like drugs and alcohol and aggression. And then uh, we need safety plans for any future suicidal thoughts, actions, uh, thoughts of actions and depression attack. 
And the last session, last stage is our personal mm. favorite because it is about optimism. Often by this stage, the depression has shifted. The person has a lot more energy. Yeah. And they're looking forward. We want a future focus that's positive. There's a lovely uh, session that we've filmed actually and it's part of, it forms part of the package if you enroll in the uh, training on exploring depression which we'll tell you about shortly and this fellow described that when he when he was you know he's grown up when he's grown up when he's um, ready he's going to become a banana farmer and we <laughs> loved that that was great at the time he was doing something completely he was an different yeah he was an and in the city wasn't yes he? in the city yeah. yeah so he's used to just going into the city doing his stuff but really his dreams of being a banana farmer and then a year after we'd finished that treatment of depression mm. He came in and he was all smiles and all big energy. And we all checked in. How's everyone going? It's been a year. And he said that he, he wasn't a banana farmer. However, <laughs> for his holiday, his wife had agreed that it's really important for him to go. And so every holiday he'd booked that he had a link now with a banana farmer and he could go and help on the farm, uh, you know, for a couple of weeks every year. So that was enough. He felt yeah. validated, his wife got it, and he had a plan to do it. Yeah. Now, what Michelle was saying there, mm. um, but actually it's important, that that was a group. Yes. And we found that the group was a very good because mm. they supported each other. Mm. They validated each other. Mm. They, it was an arena to record your successes and so on. Mm. So this is originally designed as an individual program, but we also recommend it as a group program. Yeah, yeah. I think it works so well. Mm. And especially if everyone in the group is ASP or um, autistic, whatever your uh, terminology preference is there. Now, these are some of the examples of the activities, and I'm not going to read these out because we're going to now go through them. But this is kind of a heading slide. This is where we are heading. So. Okay, we're going to give you an illustration, some of the a sort of a temptation of what's in the book itself. This is yeah. who I am. And one of the ideas is to look at your qualities. And these are qualities in personality as well as ability. So a big piece of paper and we work with the individual and those that support them. And we have a column with the heading of personality, who's the person with autism and an abilities. Now we go through what the person thinks of their qualities. They may only have one or two, but interestingly, other people will add many more that they often dismiss, but need to be recognized that that's who you are. Some of the kindest people I know have autism, caring, a very loyal friend, not into bitchiness or meanness, incredibly honest, very trustworthy, forthright, perfectionist, yes, very determined, very brave, and a wonderful sense of humour. Okay, but what are your abilities? Drawing in photographic realism, a master gamer in Halo, was it? Oh, yes, yeah. yesterday? Halo. Halo. Very classic game. Uh, yes, hey. um, exceptional long-term memory for facts and information, maybe talented in mathematics or knowledge, noticing details others wouldn't notice, or an expert on... Lizards. Lizards. We, did, <laughs> Anatomy. we, we had that. Well, yes, Georgia, who was very depressed, was amazing mm. in her understanding of the reptilian world. And when we asked each person to think of something that gave them pleasure from their life, a memory, mm. uh, everyone reflected deeply. And what she came up with was that she had a memory of visiting the Natural History Museum in Melbourne, in Australia, and she saw her favourite lizard ever. It was taxidermified. She had the, <laughs> It was a dead stuff lizard. It was a lizard. dead stuff lizard. She had the perfect pronunciation and knowledge of the Latin term for it, which I couldn't tell you now. But her face, all the rest of the time, yeah. she was so flat, so depressed. But when she spoke of this lizard, she lit up. She looked like a new person. It is. It, it's Beautiful. not an interpersonal experience no. that creates that joy. It's, it's something to do with a special interest. A special interest, yeah. yeah. Just there's something about lizards just spoke to her. And that was her joy. We saw somebody the other day whose job in the Northern Territory is yes, uh, um, studying lizards. Yeah, studying all reptiles. All she reptiles, loves snakes yes. as well, yeah. yes. And uh, her, her bliss, her life is oriented around living in the bush as a hermit, really. She hardly sees anyone. She does have work colleagues, but generally sees them online only very intermittently. And she's blissfully happy. 
Uh, it would not suit everyone, but it was a perfect choice for her. And we need people doing that. Yeah. So it's good. It, this that illustrates in a way what we're exploring now is this, uh, camouflaging and compensation. Camouflaging mm -hmm. is you act. Compensation is you create an autistic, friendly lifestyle. Yes. She showed personified compensation. She did. And yeah. she was happy, not oh. experiencing depression at yeah. all. No. Now, what we do, I know this is old fashioned, but we were both born in the last century. It's we a ring. <laughs> <laughs> There's something about paper that you yeah. know. Um, a ring binder. Now, each quality in personality or ability has its own page. Mm. And this is now a diary to record examples of when you express that. Now, it may be photographs of something that you have created, a drawing. It may be a compliment from a friend, a colleague, or a, a friend at school mm. and family members. So this is tangible, not patronizing, but you're better than you think. This is actual evidence of your qualities. But we also explore qualities of a hero in the family, your uncle who's a pilot, for example, or Doctor Who of a TV program. Now, this is somebody you admire. What is it about that character? They're brave, they are incredibly knowledgeable and so on, right? That is a quality of personality or abilities you would like to have. Let's have a page just for that because this is something you could move towards, but we need evidence, data, mm. that shows you're moving towards it. So we add entries throughout and after the program of what you've been doing, and it's moving towards a valued personality. And the book is very much is an antidote. It's very tangible. Let's have a look at this book. This shows you the qualities that you have. Absolutely. Before we go to that, though, just wanted to say one of the reasons that we do this is because a person on the autism spectrum often mm. also doesn't have a sense of self-agency that they could make positive changes mm. in their own life. So uh, what we need yes. is evidence that they can and that that evidence is documented because when it's written down in black and white, it feels more real than a memory, which can then be tainted by mm. your own negative lens that you're looking, you know, your maladaptive thinking style, your tendency toward pessimism, you rethink it the next day. This is a black and white visual potent reminder that actually you're making progress in a way that is valuable to you. Mm. So an example might be, I am a very, we met a lady yesterday. She's incredibly smart, probably a Mensa member in the future with her IQ as being so high. She was amazing at music and languages mm. when she was younger. That voice. She is unfulfilled at the moment because she knows she hasn't reached her own mm. personal potential due to executive functioning and anxiety. So she has a huge tendency to be depressed. So for her, for example, we would put for her valued personality uh, and abilities on one page, there would be her intellect and the next, the next page, her musical ability, next page, her tenacity mm. and single-mindedness to achieve her goal. And then each day she, as she moves towards her goal and just takes baby steps initially, to becoming a student of music or language or whatever she chooses to fulfill her ambition in her intellect, yeah. it can be put in the ring binder as yeah. evidence. It's being mm. trapped in inertia. For kids, yeah. for example, here's a picture of you learning to ride your bike. You thought your bike was going to kill you. You really hated it. Now, here's a picture of you. Big greening, grin, <laughs> greening? grinning really? face. Oh, really? Absolutely yeah. delighted as you're cycling along. Yeah, Challenge. Happy overcome yeah. you can do it you can do it yeah. this is possible so it's taking a goal making it a focus and just baby steps and that's why in this program the mentor support person is so so very helpful because it's so hard to always do that on your own having said that i've seen many SPs do it on their own if they decide where there's a will is a way, autism, they will get there, but they need to decide to because they're often yeah. very single track minded. Now we can go to, sorry, Tony, I had to say that, but <laughs> that's okay. Now, Maya Tode on the left there is Danish. She has autism. She's now qualified as a clinical psychologist. And yes, autism and psychology do mm. go together. Mm. Now, she was very aware that when she was young that she would have depression attacks and she would have episodic depression maybe two or three times a year. She could almost predict when they were going to occur. So what she was starting to- Sorry, explore. Tony, I'm gonna stop that clock if I can. 
Sounds oh. like Big Ben in, in, in the background. It's very loud. Okay, so you can tell this is live. Um, she thought, okay, I can sort out as a young adult my bank account. But one of the characteristics of autism can be very good at metaphor. And she thought of her bank account as a metaphor for energy accounting. And she started to recognize a pattern. Those with autism are good at patterns and systems. That there's a pattern here that when I'm drained of energy, I start to become depressed. Mm -hmm. So she's come up with the concept of an energy bank account. Mm -hmm. And in the day, you'll know this yourselves, there will be times when you have energy withdrawals, but also energy deposits. Now, if there are too many withdrawals, you have energy depletion. And so one of the very significant causes of depression in autism is energy depletion. So. Mm -hmm. We've got a cheat sheet here. We would use this with individuals. What are the things that drain you of energy? Now, remember for a neurotypical, this is going to be very different. Socializing, yeah, I can socialize. I can be the life and soul of the party. I'm fabulous, briefly, mm. two hours. Then like Cinderella at the ball at midnight, that's it. No social contact tomorrow or the day after. Socializing uses a huge amount of mental energy, change making a mistake and being critical about making a mistake. Sensory sensitivity and trying to tolerate it, just daily living skills. One of the major drains of energy is just coping with your anxiety. Mm -hmm. Over analyzing your social performance, especially if you're going to sleep at night, prevent sleep. Sensitivity to other people's moods and trying to create a barrier, being teased. Crowds, got this quite often, it's just lots of people being around. Government agencies, and in the United States, you'll have your own agencies, body shape, perceived injustice, and what Michelle and I would call mm. psychological astronomy. Mm. There are certain people who are black holes. <laughs> they, drain they just you. drain mm. you of energy. After and you've been with them, you don't feel uplifted. No. You just feel kind of flat and heavy. Yeah, yeah. It, it, but they, mm. they exist. Mm. Uh, okay, what are your deposits? Being alone, yes, it works, but it takes time. Special interest is often the fastest re-energizer. Mm -hmm. Physical activity, one of the most powerful is animals and nature. Computer games, meditation, caring for others, nutrition, major problems of sleep. It can also be something idiosyncratic, but I relate to this, is reading Harry Potter books. It's and surprising how often this one it, comes it up. Now, yeah. Michelle, I'll tell you this. Yeah. Uh, not last night, but the night before, I re-watched Harry Potter, oh. uh, Chamber of Secrets. Oh, that's one of my favorites. Oh, Doesn't it was it make so me, good. Yeah, it's so good. It, it, I love the movies as well as the books. They yes, just make me happy. It was, and yeah. I'd forgotten bits. Mm. And I, I just felt at the end, totally uplifted. Yeah. I did. It's such a great story. I think there's just so many wonderful themes of love, of friendship, of working out problems together successfully. And the whole idea of magic is always just exciting yeah it's an escape it's so, an escape yeah uh, a mental health vacation day a day off because you're not physically unwell but you haven't got the energy to cope mm. sometimes information on the internet in autism there's often a brain that needs to be fed information being with pets and certain people are the sun that's that the opposite they, they energize, they energize you. Mm. people in your life that mm. do that but now you have a see a numerical measure usually from zero to a hundred so on some days, socializing, zero to 100, 100 is really bad. How was today or this week? It's not something you do every day. You may do it at the end of the week or the end of the month, but you need to monitor your energy levels. Ah, uh, socialize 80, bad, or 20. Yeah, that was okay. Now we have a daily energy account form, which lists all the withdrawals and all the deposits and the score of zero to 100. And we use this not necessarily daily, maybe weekly or monthly to really assess, are you in the black or in the red? Now, this is an illustration, a 15 year old girl with Asperger's syndrome in Australia. These were some of her withdrawals being late to school. We found that a few oh, times. Oh, yeah, we? they yeah. don't like it. it the, the fact it is being looked at when they walk in late to the classroom, mm. they hate the social attention. Yeah. Mm. Now, some days coping, 10, some days not, 40. Mm. Just crowds of people. Mum being cranky, mm. 30 to 100. Now, she has an autistic brother. She's autistic herself. And sometimes mum will get upset with her brother. Now, it's nothing to do with her. But the mere fact that mum was upset mm 
made her Perfect. feel yeah. despair. Yep. Yeah. It's that um, empathic hyper arousal. It is, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, friends not being nice to each other. Mm -hmm. Yes, she would spend a lot of the lunchtime going around to the friends, making sure that everybody's happy. I want everybody to be happy. Mm -hmm. Friends own problems, 20 to 90, that's the empathy. Noise in class, 20 to 30. Mm -hmm. So we would work, what are the withdrawals? For her, reading Harry Potter. Yeah. Uh, dancing freestyle in a bedroom. Gets yeah. home from high school. Goes into a bedroom, locks the door so her brother can't get in, cranks up the sound system, dances freestyle, gets it out of her system. It's great Talk movement. Yeah, great. it is. Mm. Talking to boys, she found girls are bitchy, mean, and vicious in ways she doesn't get. But the boys either like you or they don't, mm. and they're very logical. So talking to boys, she found was an energy deposit yeah. and quiet time it's in her common, bedroom. Isn't it it the is. Girls? Yeah, yeah. They like the boys because of that simplicity. They're easier. Not so me, not bitchy. I know it's a compliment. Nice <laughs> and simple. Nice, we, easy. We, we are. I relate we are. To you. We, we say <laughs> what we mean. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you say what you mean. Straightforward. Yeah. I like it. It is, but that's what the person is looking for. Uh, the duplicity uh, of mm. the girls is a problem. Now, you just add the numerical values, but the key point of energy accounting is if you are in the red, you must schedule more mm. energy infusing activities into the next day or week. It's crucial that this is done because yes. this is the, the treatment in a way. This is the treatment. You yeah. need to do that. You need energy. And I mean, we use this in our own lives. It's easy for anyone, uh, regardless of whether they're depressed or autistic or anxious to become very overwhelmed by all of the activities of life. And, and when we introduce this idea to our guys in the groups, for example, or in individual therapy, they often self-reflect and go, you know, I never really thought about scheduling in pleasurable activities. Uh, maybe that's why I'm depressed. <laughs> we go, yeah, I think you're onto something yeah. there. Yeah, I, I think if you don't, schedule and pleasure it's probably going to be a dreary and energy depleting life yeah yeah you've yeah. got to do what we love what lights us up yeah. what's meaningful to us and it doesn't mean that it has to be hedonistic in that i'm just going to sit down and eat a whole chocolate cake or drink a cask mm. of wine uh it's more about you know the person who's depressed obviously often has forgotten what causes pleasure so it's more about reflecting on what have I enjoyed in the past that I could potentially draw into my life now? And we find mm. that for many on the spectrum, it's old interests, you know, that oh, I used to really love. So, for example, I'm, I'm treating a girl for depression at the moment. She's 24. She's lovely. She's ASD level two. She's really depressed about not being able to be as independent as she would like because of autism. And she's brought back her care bears into her life. So she speaks to her care bears yes. and it's joyful. You can see her light up because for her, when she was going through school and she was lonely, they were her friends and she's invited her friends back into her life. Yes, mm. it, it, it is being flexible and, yeah. um, and original to the person and yeah. exploring. It, it worked exactly. for you. It can still work. It, Don't feel embarrassed by no, it. It's good. It's good if it's going to cause yeah. pleasure and it's not going to hurt anyone. It's for you. It's good. So we, we've had that with teenagers with My Little Ponies. Oh yeah. Yes. I love the show My Little Ponies, and yet you'd think that would be an age-related interest. It's not necessarily an autism. It can come in at any time. Ah, we're moving into a new area now. This is really about uh, shifting our thinking. You know, earlier we were talking about how in a, inwardly critical we can be. And this is very much felt by people on the autism spectrum who are depressed. So what we suggest is that they create their own, what we call a self-affirmation pledge. And this is uh, certainly, it's an affirmation, which I know has uh, some, so certain affirmations will not work definitely for the person however affirmations can work if they're carefully crafted to feel acceptable to the person as they read it to themselves so if the person reads it and they go ah oh, that will never happen that's not me that's just going to be a mind fighting with mm. itself we don't want that it needs to be from the heart of how the person truly wants to live it's a it's a self-expression 
And if they can have this, these words, this feeling in their body and mind each day as they enter the day, it's their intentionality of how they're going to live in the day. This idea comes from yoga, living intentionally, and the idea of a pledge to oneself we borrowed from mm. Leanne Holiday Willie, who is yeah. uh, American as a, our audience today, an amazing woman, a pioneer a woman yeah. on the autism spectrum, mm. the first to share her story about being Asperger. Yes, yeah. I think it was Leanne who coined the term Aspie. She did. I think it came Yeah, from I think it did, mm. Aspie. There's more noise here, I hope it's not picking up too much. We have the garbage collectors. Now we have the garbage collectors. It's very light, isn't it? Uh, this is hers. I am not defective. I am different. I will not sacrifice my self-worth for peer acceptance. I am capable of getting along with society. I will ask for help when I need it. I will be patient with those who need time to understand me. And I will accept myself for who I am. Mm. And that's really what we're leading toward. That's our hope in our psychotherapy mm. for depression, self-acceptance for the person as they are, who they are, that they are beautiful and that they are perfect as they are. We're yeah. not trying to change them. We're trying to change the depressive thinking. We're trying mm. to change behavior so yeah. that their body and mind gets what they need to feel good about themselves, to get the right level of you know, hormones and serotonin in the body but we're not trying to change the person. We're not into cure of autism, for example. Mm -hmm. So another, now we borrowed this uh, activity for thinking tools from the movement in positive psychology. There's a lot of research that shows people who are grateful tend to be happier. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting yeah. because as humans, we tend to habituate to happiness. You know, for example, um, the, you know, that old Chinese proverb, uh, if you want to be happy for a, I'll, I'll have to make it up because I can't remember what it is. But it's if you want to be happy for a minute, eat a chocolate cake. If you want to be happy for a day, you, I don't know, you go to the movies or you go shopping and buy a handbag. If you want to be happy for a year, you buy a house. And if you want to be happy for two years, you get married. That's about <laughs> I now. just got that. Yeah. <laughs> what that is all about is, that, of course, whatever makes us happy doesn't just make us continually happy. Mm. Uh, we need to appreciate what's in our life for it to make us happy. And the way we do this is we make gratitude a practice. And so we get all of our participants in this particular program to list at least five things that they're grateful for. If they're very visual thinkers, which is often the case in autism, they may actually go to the internet, use Google images and print out pictures of those and make a collage mm -hmm. of what makes them yeah. happy. Yeah. So there's a visual reminder. The research shows that if you do a gratitude list every day, you get bored and it stops being helpful. If you do it once a week, it, it can actually increase your set point of happiness. But the trick is to dwell. So as you remember the things you're grateful for, not just to list them, oh, good, I got that out of the way and move on to the next task, but to dwell on them, to feel the appreciation through the mind and the body is the key. So there's a list, intelligence, you're grateful for your pet, your parents, your computer, JK Rowling, that she exists, and Star Trek is an example. <laughs> that may come up. Now, there are certain advantages in having autism uh, and they may be missed by the person. As you would remember, one of the reasons for feeling sad as an autistic person can be just the diagnosis itself, particularly for teenagers, we find this to be true. But of course, there's a value in being different. We need our autistic members of our community because without autism, each area of human endeavor would be stilted. Yeah. We would not have gone as far as we have. Uh, we both believe that it's highly likely that the people who have been able to create the vaccinations for COVID right now are probably the ones with autism. Mm -hmm. you no, know, if you have autism, you can go further than uh, uh, other people have been because usually it's usually because of the combination of your abilities and your tenacity, single track mind. So there's achievers across the sciences, the arts, humanities. We need to recognize that autism brings qualities as well as difficulties. So our advice always is to be a first rate auty not a second rate neurotypical, yeah. trying to be someone else. Yeah. There's a wonderful book, we've got that there, which is difficult to see uh, because of our, um, our little 
postage stamp sized uh, pictures, but uh, it's on Beethoven, The Asperger Connection. And that you love that book. I did. Yeah. Walter is uh, Dutch and he's an expert in autism. And he went through the history from childhood because mm. he was Beethoven was a, a prodigy and uh, highlighted. And I've done that, too, throughout the book all the autistic characters. Now, if you wanted to know Beethoven, it was not in his social conversation abilities, it was his music. That's significant because later on, we'll be talking how music and music therapy, oh, in other yes. words, create a playlist of songs mm. that describe your feeling more eloquently than you can say with speech. That's what happened with Beethoven. That is a wonderful segue into mm. this slide. Oh. This, is, this is the next slide. We are talking about Oh, we that. are talking about that. Perfect Good. timing. Mm. Uh, so we're talking about lexithymia and using visuals to, uh, and art to represent sadness. As Tony said, we ask our participants of this program to create a playlist and to have several playlists. So sometimes this sadness can only be expressed mm. through music. I've come through, come across this so often with my clients. This... Uh, this feeling of heaviness inside that is just kind of like the air that you breathe. It's just the normal. But when you listen to certain tracks, you can access the depths of the sadness and cry. And the cry, the tears, is is, the tears mm. have a chemical in them that are healing. That's why we have yeah. tears. And that allows the sadness to move through the system. Everyone has sadness. We all need to um, uh understand that, recognize it and express it essentially. So some of our participants in groups, particularly actually in the teenage years, are um, budding songwriters. They've brought beautiful songs. I'm just thinking of Belinda mm -hmm. and her song that she sang to the whole group and no one had a dry eye because of the pain in that song. And she had no instrument, she just no, sang it. Just a, a cappella, isn't it? A just cappella. on yes. her own. And she was beautiful in that moment, her authentic self shining through with the <coughs> incredible sadness she felt at being different and that no one would ever understand. Mm -hmm. And we all, sorry, we all understood and we all felt it and we felt it together. And she felt that. Yes. And that's healing, to feel validated, seen, to be seen and accepted. Is yes, very, and it was so genuine clear. from everyone so genuine. in the group. She beautiful. felt, I've been listened to. Yeah. People get it. Yeah. yeah, and that connection is so powerful. So um, it could be a painting, a sculpture, as we talked about earlier. Many love poetry, and that it'll either be expression of emotion through reading poetry and feeling uh, their feelings in that in that moment, or writing their own poetry or short story. It could be they bring in to show you a scene in the movie. If you're supporting someone through this, they might show you a scene that really perfectly for them resonates with their feelings and so they can share that or they can actually create a video animation or collage on their own to show you so i'm speaking to you as if you'll be the mentor or support person and these are the sorts of things we'd encourage mm. I, i'm going to get back to harry potter yes again because oh, do. I, I love yeah. harry potter yeah. um but it's the mentors and it's using the metaphor, choose a passage from one of the Harry Potter books mm. and Dementor. I mean, Bogarts are anxiety and mm. Dementors are depression. Mm. And, and you have a metaphor that the person can really conceptualize, visualize and work with. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Of course, as we said earlier, there are maladaptive patterns of thinking that tend to come up in depression. And these, they, they maintain depression, really. they keep it going. And the ones that are very common in autism, we found, are the tendency to catastrophize. So in other words, not to take something as it is of, OK, uh, I've lost my job or um, the, this is a friend that I really thought was a friend I've just found out is not a friend. It is painful. It hurts or it's scary. And I don't know what's going to happen next. In other words, there's a negative feeling, yes, but it's not a catastrophe. It's not the end of the world. It doesn't mean that you're a failure. It doesn't mean that you'll never have a positive feeling ever again. There isn't the end of the world doom and gloom story actually happening in your life. It feels like it is, but it's not that. It's just feeling. And that is very difficult for all humans mm. to absorb and really experience because in that moment, especially in autism, because they feel their emotions so intensely and they can go way deep, really mm. deep into the emotion and see nothing else but mm. that emotion. 
And in that, of course, lies, lies a catastrophe. The, that's okay, but it's when you come out of that emotion to realize, oh, I was just catastrophizing. Mm. It's not that bad. I just felt it was that bad and have a different thought and feeling mm. later on. With ASD, no, they tend to take the cat catastrophic thinking into the future, which is problematic. Mm. Another very one true. that's yeah. very common in ASD is black and white thinking. So it's that, oh, I made a mistake, therefore the whole project is ruined and I've got to put it all in the bin and sacrifice all the good work that I've done. <laughs> yes. Oh, you can't stand it when they do that. It's so hard. You think, no, you're really good. But mm. they can't see that because one thing, a tiny thing often just makes everything else no good. And it, uh, people I've worked with have described it to me like it's a little bit of ink in water. You just drop that ink in, ink in, it's one mistake, but it tarnishes everything. And they really see it that way. It's a good metaphor. Mm, yeah, yeah, it is. It's like that. And, then, it's, and yeah. then how do you get the ink out of the water? You can't. So the whole thing is contaminated. But we have yeah. to say, actually, it's, it's not like that. It, mm. That's a good analogy, but it's not actually working like that. One mistake doesn't render the whole of yeah. the rest of what you're doing in your life a disaster. Suppression and avoidance, we've talked about, they're huge in autism. A lot of people on the spectrum, rather than use more adaptive uh, processes like seeking support mm. or cognitive reappraisal, tend to use stuff it down. Mm. There's a bad feeling, get rid of it. Don't want to feel that. Avoid situations that cause that feeling, like being with people or going outside in the bright lights or just recognize I'm feeling bad today I'm just going to have it on the screen all day today day and I'm not going to think about anything that's that stuffing it down mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and one of the ultimate avoidance is becoming a recluse in your bedroom it is yeah. the ultimate yeah. yeah and we've seen that too often yes. in yeah. depression unfortunately so what are some adaptive thinking styles instead one of them that I always it's my go to in therapy for teaching people with autism is how to self soothe. Mm -hmm. The inner voice yeah. tends to be the inner critic. They speak to themselves incredibly harshly. They call themselves inside things like you're an idiot, you're lazy, you're stupid, you're yeah. a failure. You don't know what you're talking about. No one would ever love you or like you. There's this very incessant harsh tone and harsh voice and when I start when we start talking about how to recognize that voice to notice it and to just tone it down into something softer something that a voice inside that you would use with um, a friend but if if you're very distressed if you're really feeling a negative um, feeling intensely you really need to be spoken to in a very gentle way uh, it's almost like speaking to a child and that person at that time when they're very very sad or very angry or very upset about something needs a voice that just says you know what you, you're going to be okay and and you're a really good person and you're suffering right now and that's okay we all suffer sometimes and this is a moment of suffering and just i'm just going to sit with this i'm just going to be with you at this time i'm going to stay and i'm going to help you through and that self-soothing voice, like a parent would to a young child, is a way that the autonomic nervous system that's got involved mm. can start to relax and go, oh, I'm going to be okay. The way you did that was perfect. <laughs> I practice it myself. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> On good. myself. Yes. I totally believe in what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've actually, uh, as I say, this is a go-to tool at the beginning of any therapy that I do with a, a client who's yeah. depressed or anxious or dissociating or tra traumatised. How do you self-soothe? How do you hold yourself when you're going through these tough, tough mm -hmm. moments of suffering is so important. Some people in the autism spectrum will really fight this. They, what's going on often is they don't feel they deserve it. They don't deserve that soft voice. They believe they deserve punishment. Yeah. And, and that, that seems to be internally driven. It's not a yes. reflection of parents or teachers. Mm -hmm. no. no, very internal. So yeah. we have to do some work there about, uh, you know, the basic... Um, worthiness of humans and that they're human and just on that note just on that foundation uh, they deserve self-soothing and yeah. love but it's a process to work through 
the um, other adaptive thinking style is is really difficult if you're very anxious and rigid and that is to think of alternative perspectives mm. so if you recognize oh my first one is to catastrophize what's a different way of thinking about this mm, that flexibility yeah. and the it's flexibility. a part of autism yeah. almost in the diagnostic criteria it's is a lack the, of flexible thinking mm. this is going to affect this, therapy it yeah. really does but uh, what i found is that when the person's calm and they can access their mm. intellect uh, I might use the analogy of uh, road signs, you know, at the moment, well, that's our alarm to say we're five minutes away from our time being up. So we might speed up. Ooh. So, yeah. <laughs> oh. So instead of it being a dead end, we're actually at a roundabout. Let's think of other ways of conceptualizing, perceiving this problem. And that's where being a mentor can help because you can actually point out, ah, oh, I think we're feeling stuck. Maybe we can think of the roundabout is that what you call them in america roundabouts they don't have roundabouts you don't have roundabouts no, oh, no. When, when you americans come to australia and you come to a roundabout you have no idea what to do and go around the wrong way it's very confusing it's very confusing mm. so a roundabout is the place where you come to in the road and there's a circle and there's lots of different roads from there that you can go off and they're the alternative perspectives yeah. it could be to have disclosure we say a problem shared is a problem halved. Think of social support. It could be a positive reappraisal, recognizing, oh, I have a tendency to pessimism. That's not reality. Reality is a balanced view. Is, am I being overly pessimistic or could there be a positive outcome here? So to reappraise it, these thinking tools are more available when the person's calmer. If they're very anxious or angry, excuse me, or agitated, there's these thinking styles are not available. We have to wait for the autonomic nervous system to relax. They also, um, an adaptive process is to seek and respond to compassion and affection and seeing if that's possible, either self-compassion or from another person can be very helpful. Now, we will not go through this um, in a big way, but just to say that it's really helpful if you're looking for any change, whether behavioral change or thinking changes to self-monitor. Mm. We stay on track better if we use self-monitoring very quickly on a daily basis, what we did differently, how it made us feel before and after. And also we use weekly planners because we know in autism there's often executive functioning issues so they won't necessarily remember unless there's a weekly plan <clears throat> and it's either on the smartphone and gives you an alarm, mm. like I just set an alarm to know we're nearly done. Um, it might be an alarm to say, oh, now's the time to go and do some movement or now's the time mm. to do your cognitive reappraisal exercises, for yep. example. Autism, you're very much prompt dependent. Yes. And you need someone either to verbally prompt you or something you can see. Now, we look at other helpful tools, medication. We look at the good aspects and concerns. And sometimes the depth of depression is too deep for psychological strategies we may need medication to help. Now, there may also be religious, spiritual, or personal beliefs and discuss your feelings with a senior Sorry. member of your church or group, okay? And that is really from a, a deeper spiritual basis. One of the things we found, we didn't realize, but nutrition, avoid junk food. Sleep is also an issue. Those with autism are notorious for a difficulty getting to sleep, staying asleep, quality and duration. Sometimes sleep assessments are associated. And one of the signs of depression is disturbed sleep. So we need to work on both. Also, another helpful tool is a caring role, a volunteer of somebody who needs help, caring for animals, being appreciated and needed. Unhelpful tools can be alcohol or drugs. Alcohol is a relaxant at low level, but in the long term, excessive use of alcohol will produce depression mm -hmm. and also drugs, marijuana, etc. And it's a way of self-medicating. It works, but it's not good long term. So there may need to be advice from alcohol and drug dependency services. Self-harm, yep, it temporarily makes you feel better, not good in the long term. Or that agitated, externalized explosion, now I feel better, hurting someone else. So we will go through how to cope with those. Now, self-harm occurs for some reasons. Okay, mm. self-hatred. I hate myself, I'm stupid. And in a way, it's almost a form of punishment. I must be punished for being bad. Sometimes 
it's to feel something because of a pervasive numbness. In autism, there's a mind-body division and low-level self-harm actually puts you back in touch with your body. Sometimes it's to feel physical pain mm. to block emotional pain. I'm, I'm now dealing with the blood and, that, and all the things I've got to do. And what I was worried about has gone because I got this practical thing. But also when I talk to an individual who's doing self-harm, I say, doesn't it hurt? And they say, no the opposite it relaxes me yes. and that's a concern mm -hmm. so in other words if it works fine our job is to find alternatives and hurting someone else or smashing something as a tension release mechanism now depression attack is mm -hmm. autistic they arrive unexpectedly the person isn't aware they're brewing because of interception problems and extremely intense it's an emotional implosion there's a desperate need to end the despair and sometimes the despair is so bad that they will do something impulsive and dramatic that is dangerous so it is a serious occasion can be intense but fortunately brief now we're going to go through a safety plan mm. for a depression attack these are strategies for you the autistic person mm. please immediately seek practical or emotional help this is an emotional emergency, okay? You need to let someone know. Try to remove yourself from the situation that triggered the depression attack. Try and go into nature. Try to go somewhere that you are away from the causes of your despair. Try not to harm yourself. And sometimes the special interest is the off switch. It suppresses it for a while, but gets rid of the intensity. And it is the intensity that is the concern. Mm. Now, this is for the support person. Stay, stay calm and reassure it. No interrogation. What's the matter? What are you upset about? Won't work. Don't ask what's the matter because they can't tell you. They can't put it into words. You must stay with them because accidents will happen. Try not to fix the problem because they're not going to listen to reason. If they're being unreasonable, reason won't work. Not to move in too close without prior approval. Can I move close to you? If they say yes, okay. But if not, you pull back. Now we go through in the program, a time machine, as Michelle was saying, yeah. imagining the life you want, planning how to have that. We also go through a program review of what's worked. And yes. one of the major things that we found is that physical activity, yoga, meditation, mm. and mindfulness. They're the main ones. Yeah. And yeah. they're not conventional psychology. No, not no. conventional in terms of cognitive behavior therapy or cognitive reappraisal. Mm. But that's also, I think, because when you're really depressed, just like when you're really mm. anxious, cognitive reappraisal doesn't work. You can't think your way out of it. No. Yeah. Otherwise they would have. Otherwise they, they think about it all the yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. So, and they're good at analysis usually, our guys on the spectrum. They're very smart. They can work it out and they're logical. They need a different state of mind to feel differently. Yeah. Then they can do things It's almost as though they're good at analysis yes. and taking things apart, yeah. but not putting it together again. No, not in, to in a different way. Yeah. yeah. Putting it together in the same way that still yeah. looks depressing is possible but it doesn't help them. But if we can get that shift in the state of mind that they feel differently because of different hormonal mixes mm. of movement or mindfulness, meditation, then you can get traction. Then they can start to shift their own ideas about, yeah. about their life and themselves. Okay, now assessing and maintaining your progress. And we look at relapse prevention uh, with a mood diary, with a, a measure of your depression numerically so that you can track because mm. it can be cyclical this time of year all sorts of things may occur. Now, what we find is that once you know that depression is possibly imminent, you now have an effective way of reducing the depth and duration of that. Now, mm. we've had feedback from participants. This is a group we had, which we ran, came back a year later and said, okay, guys, how's it going? And these are some of the comments. I now have new coping mechanisms. Mm. Yeah. Feeling depressed lasts for only a few days not a few months, and that's what we want. Mm. You, you can't get rid of depression, but not so deep, not so long. When I feel depressed, it is now a three out of 10, not an eight mm. out of 10. Mm. I jump on it a lot earlier. And individual differences in what strategies. Some, it was nature, animals, etc. So we go through a range of options. Now, our final slide. Uh, do you want me to talk about yes, this? Yes, please do. Yeah. Yeah. This is the program I mentioned earlier where Tanya and I have filmed ourselves in a full day training to professionals and participants who have autism and depression on 
how do you how do you do this program on your own? Uh, so it is available. We we're able to post it up on our website. So our website is Atwood and Garnet Events. Uh, this is the uh, this is the program exploring depression training in a CBT program for adolescents and adults who have autism and depression. It's five hours and 18 minutes, not to be pedantic. <laughs> I did, love that. did you time it? Uh, no, that's just what comes <laughs> up on our website because okay. it's just, uh, it's, it's put up in segments and the program itself times it. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of handouts um, and, and yeah, I, I just will leave it with you. If you are interested in going further, there is that possibility you can do that with us um, through that program. And that is the end of our formal presentation. And there's Kathy. Kathy, Kathy has returned. Hi, Kathy. So Kathy, we, we actually managed to do that in an hour. Wow, that's actually very good. We didn't know, know. we could do that in. It was, it was very well done. I, I think that this is such a topic that many of our families, many of our um, autistic adults who call us, you know, are saying that, you know, this past year, especially has really taken a toll on them and they don't know how to deal with some of this. So, uh, you know, I'm really happy that we, uh, we got to address this and came up with some tools and strategies and that they can review it. And then there's something at the end if they want to further it and, and really dive into things. I think that's great. You, you are both wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I love that we, we not only, we had to start an hour early, so there's a change. Then we yeah. have the garbage being picked up. And I believe I hear birds happening over there. Do you guys? Some birds? Yeah, yes. yeah. Yep. With birds. Yep. It's all very kind of happening, isn't it? <laughs> Usually we have the front door shut, but we just didn't think of that. But anyway, I'm glad that you were able to go with all the um, ambience of everyday life in yeah, West it, End. It, it makes it all, all real and yeah. personal. Yeah, yeah it's everyday very life. Um, now we did have a, a. I don't know. I noticed in your presentation you talked about okay. autism and suicide, and you actually mentioned Lisa Morgan. She lives here in Maine. I don't know if you know that. And no, I didn't know that. Presentation that she put up. I don't know if you can click on your question and answer box, but yeah, she I can. actually. If you click it open, you'll see she's asking you a question. Oh okay. my goodness. Hello, Lisa. We are in a book together. I'm, I'm really um, privileged to meet you, <laughs> even though it's so one This is a big occasion. It's a big occasion for me. Yeah, yeah the, um, Lisa is a co-author in our book, uh, Spectrum Women, Walking to the Beat of Autism. I'm so proud of being able to be in that book with 15 other autistic women mm. and experiences. But Lisa, we have a question. I will read it out. Um, do you think self-criticism and being extremely hard on ourselves can be due to in internalized ableism from hearing so many times from others that we are not enough? How can one diagnose later in life, overcome years and years of rejection, negative comments from others, which has turned in, into internalized ableism? That is such a good question, Lisa. Uh, we will take it in turns. I'll just um, start. The Yes, that I think, unfortunately, this is um, so common, especially mm. I find in, I'm doing a lot of work now with late diagnosed autistic women and there's a lot of internalized ableism. There's this um, feeling of being different, therefore defective, not good mm. enough, and an incredibly strong internal critic. And that's why I always start with the self-soothing uh, strategies because I find those to be so helpful when practiced on a daily basis with intentionality to be able to, uh, at least we can't completely mute that internal critic but we can turn the volume down when it gets too hard. Yeah. So I, I would suggest never trying to, I shouldn't say never because never is too black and white, but uh, try to, res I think we need to always as humans try to resist that um, we can get rid of certain thoughts. There's certain thoughts, uh, patterns of thinking that are just gonna stay with us till the end. Um, but it's getting comfortable with those, being able to live alongside them and go and recognize them and, and go, okay, you know, that's my ableism story. <laughs> that's, mm. it's here, I can't do anything about it. And not, and of course it will still affect us, uh, but it affects us less on a moment by moment mm. basis if we're aware of it and we're 
actively practicing a different strategy inside yeah. where our allegiance you know the wolf we're feeding on the shoulders is the the soother the one who's on our side the the person inside who really has our back the one who knows us and and wants to uh really fall in love uh, with who we are and how we mm. are in the world and support that internal person who supports mm. us all the way through mm. the observer the caring part of ourselves yeah i think when we find out what is the voice that's going through your head i think a lot of those voices of ableism and criticism so on actually come from peer group and with that's what we need is a uh, paradigm shift amongst peers to accept autism. One of the concerns that we have here in uh, Australia, and you may have that in the United States, is the term autism amongst teenagers is now a derogatory term. Mm. So if anybody makes a social error, <laughs> what's the matter with you? Are you autistic or something? Mm. And so when we look at it, a lot of it comes from negative feedback from peers and not having a friend to contradict it. A neurotypical would have a best friend who said, nah, they don't mean it, etc. And the person then ruminates on it, which consolidates it and makes it a belief. Now that belief becomes a way of perceiving things. And you will only accept, I'm stupid, I'm useless, etc. that confirms their belief. But when Michelle or I said, no, no, that's not true. That's heresy mm. to their self-belief. So it's something we need to recognize, but certainly to make sure that the peer group don't cruelly destroy the self-esteem of that person with autism. Can I just add one more thing that I meant to say in that too, and that is the role of trauma. Mm. So we know there's a lot of research now that shows that uh, autistic people are more vulnerable to developing PTSD and acute stress reactions after traumatic events, whether they're big T events like molestation, self sexual abuse, rape, um, war crimes, etc., cetera, or, or what we call little T events, which can be bullying and teasing at school, belittled by a teacher, overly criticized by a mum or a dad uh, and there's lots of examples there however we know now that we have good therapeutic tools for managing trauma and mm. when I say managing it I mean being able to treat the trauma so that that intrusive memory which might be a, an image that keeps coming up with all the affect and we're reliving it all the time and we're having nightmares hypervigilance that it might happen again there's some very good treatments for managing that now mm. so emdr for example has had good research efficacy with adults on the autism spectrum mm. and i think we you know there's a lot more we can do to assist people with their inner self-critic that's there because of trauma so mm. treating the trauma is important yeah Trauma is huge, and I think that we see a lot of that here when we when we talk with families and um, autistic adults. And there's been some sort of trauma in their past, and and it, it brings up these emotions. And people, yeah. we always at least will address that first. Is before you dive into something, you know, look to see if there was it's trauma based because yes. sometimes it, it is, and they're not even relating it to that. Exactly. Yeah, and that can cause a lot of mind disturbance along the lines of inner critic, never good enough. So when you hit that uh, self-punishment, mm. someone might be self-harming and or, or believe that they are not worthy of getting some soothing, internal soothing, for example. They're not open to connecting with others. I find there's often trauma in the background. Yeah. There's no trust. They can't trust. It's not safe. Yeah. Yes, trust is a big issue yeah. Yeah. because the person has been let down. And, and what, the interesting thing is the most honest and loyal person is an autistic person. Yeah. And yet they've experienced far worse circumstances than typical individuals. Yeah. So strong. Yeah. You know, and Kathy, this, another sorry, question. Um, I was about to say, yeah, another question from Miriam. Yeah. Do you want us to take that one now? Yeah. Okay. So Miriam, thank you for your question. It is any suggestions for creating buy-in, particularly when someone is stuck in pessimism? That is, thank you. That is again, <laughs> a fantastic question because this is one of the issues. So you can buy the book, you can put it on the shelf, you can even put it right in front of them. But if they're not going to even try to do something different, we're not going to get any traction at all in that. Um, the buy-in that uh, we are looking for, what I would suggest uh, is to look for the carrot for that person. Yeah. So, you know, we don't know what it is, but I found that if sometimes my therapy, for example, has started 
in telehealth, they're, they're not willing to come out of the bedroom, but they're willing to meet me on their own computer at home. Or sometimes they'll come to the clinic and they'll, I'll have a conversation through a car door window. Uh, mm. but they won't come into the yeah. clinic, but you know, and then we might gravitate to a cafe. Uh, but the way I, the, the in is my experience is um, listening and just trying to determine for that person what they truly, truly want. And um, and you and it's just making a relationship with them to the point that they can tell you that, and then building the blocks of, hey, uh, you know, I think I've got some things that will help with that. I want that for you too, and joining on that goal. Um, for example, a depressed, very depressed, twenty-two-year-old um, man that we met yesterday, he desperately wants to be independent. Now, at the moment, the reason he wants to be independent is so that he can have his own house with a computer so he can play <coughs> Halo all day. Like, okay, we don't want him playing Halo all day, but we want to join on that goal mm. of independence because that's got traction for him. So I would just say, try and find the carrot for the person. Mm. Well, well, yes, well, one of the, that we found when we had our groups of teenagers, the going rate was $50 to attend. Oh, so yes, parents would say, would if you go and see yeah. Michelle and Tony, We'll pay you fifty dollars, and they do for the first session. Yeah, but not afterwards. No, they say no. I want to. And the so best measure be of success is they turn up because autism gives you many ways of avoiding what you want to do. You you know how to. And what we find is that the attendance rate for the programs is very high, mm. and it starts off purely in a lucrative sense. What's in it for me? Fifty dollars. Oh, great! But once they're there, oh, mm. this is useful. Mm. That, that, that's you, really about joining with them. Do you yeah. find that, um, cause we run some support groups for um, individuals that are on the spectrum, whether they're teens or, or autistic adults, um, they wanna be with each other. Uh, and that's what we find. We find that they gravitate towards each other. They show common interests. And then that socialization, although it's awkward, is there because they're, they're socializing with somebody that has an interest like they have which is unlike other interests that we see. So you find exactly. that also? We find that also, mm -hmm. definitely. That's one of the reasons we love the groups because the like-mindedness seems to form this lovely connection, whether it's common interests or just, you know, it's really common to have similar experiences, uh, you know, joining mm -hmm. on puzzling peers. Why do they do that? Like the girls will always say, oh, the topics of the other girls at school are so boring. <laughs> why, do we talk, why do they talk about makeup, fashion, boys? And, and pop stars pop and, and stars. things like that. That's boring. Justin I want to talk about Bieber. Donald Trump. Yeah, they want to talk about world politics and weather and climate. And, you know, they're in the big topics. And that's often why they like men because, you know, the, the boys, because they're also interested in facts and information, mm. not this other kind of weird girly stuff. Well, I don't know if you have time for one more question, but we do have one more in the question and answer box if you'd like to look at Jessica Welch. Okay, we okay let's take question? this one. Okay, last right. question. okay. Right. any tips on supporting compliance with completing the self-monitoring sheets? I find that people struggle to do that even if they use reminders on their smartphone. And then we lack significant information to help them problem. Yes. It is difficult. We oh. have the same problem, Jessica. Yes. And, and we haven't found a satisfactory explanation or, or strategy other than the nagging. And, <laughs> and I'm afraid we have to. If we're going to use technical terms, it's yeah, prompt, on it. prompt dependent. Prompt dependent. The and support yeah, person. It is. Mm. It, it's almost as though in the one track mind, they're focusing on this but they've not got the alarm clock going off that you need to do this, that, and the other. Now, in a job, that's great because you really do focus on the job, but you don't have the diversity in thinking. And that seems to be an executive functioning rigidity that mm. is actually a part of autism. Mm. So it is an autistic characteristic and we don't have a satisfactory solution other than prompts and mercenary yeah. in terms of, these are the benefits for you if you do. Mm. The, and just to add to what Tanya was saying, I we also, if someone hasn't had a chance to do it on the week, we're never into punishment. It's never kind of, mm, you know, are you serious about this therapy? What's going on? It's more, um, okay, that happens. It can be a busy week. Can we do it now? And spending some time in the session using reflection, it's not as good, but at least it's kind of demonstrating that this is important. We don't want to move on in the program until we've got this information. 
Because as you say, Jessica, it's about conceptualization, problem solving, we need the information. And the other thing I've found is sometimes they're adverse to writing. So just mm. using voice memos can be helpful. So they just have to quickly, just a quick voice memo and it's done and that's it. Um, and the other one, oh, uh, sometimes too, I'll say, just think it, self-reflect and just think it and come ready to talk. So they're not, they've done their homework, but it's all in their head. They didn't have to write it out, which felt very school-like and they didn't like the homework. And but the word just, homework just is Just self-reflection. Yeah. And mm. I found that had, that's got traction. They appreciate that. I think it feels um, very, I don't know, it just felt very respectful that if you can self-reflect on that, that's gonna be really helpful too. So mm. there's some ideas. Well, thank you both so very much for joining us. It's, as you can see, it's getting dark now here in our state. It is. Uh, nice it, for you. Yeah, it gets it gets dark around 730, quarter of eight. So we start to get dark over here. Um, but I can't thank you enough. We, we do have evaluations that go out after this. We send them to everybody and then we'll make sure to send them your way too. But we're very excited that you got to join us tonight. And I can't say enough about having, we, we've had speakers all month for um, April acceptance month, awesome. autism mm -hmm. acceptance month. So we well, really do these awesome. webinars all, all month, so. Gosh, that's such a wonderful mm -hmm. thing that you're doing, Kathy. I, I just admire what you're putting together so much. It's so helpful to families. And I hope this can be shared mm -hmm. and that it can help a lot of people. Thank you for the positive feedback. It means a lot to it, us. It does. Thank it, you. Th this is why we're here. On our screen, we actually have some of the comments of people. And the thank you, terrific workshop and so on. So and nice. in a way, what we're trying to bring is, is not academic, it's practical. Right. And there are some strategies that you can take away today. What we would ask people who have tuned in, please pass on these strategies to other parents that you meet as well. This needs to be, th yeah. this is um, common yeah. sense in yeah. many ways. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's what we do here. The society is all about making sure families have, and adults also have um, the tools that they need to, yeah. to get things accomplished. Yeah. We can't thank you enough for everything. And hopefully you can come to back to America and start oh, wars. And Michelle's never been to Maine, Tony. And I know you've been because I've met you. A couple I, I, I have indeed. And, and, and crab cakes and all those sorts of things come to mind. Oh, um, well, I love crab we cakes. would love to. If we're like invited, yeah, we, we, would, love we would love to. We oh, really great. would. Well, thank you both so very much. We're, we're very happy. Now you can go and have your second thank cup you. of coffee. And I oh, yes, please. <laughs> yes. We'll go and start our day. Thank you so much for hosting us, mm. Kathy. We've really enjoyed it. We really appreciate you and what you're okay. doing. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, okay. everyone. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.